Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry for the little delay there. My name's Tom Fifields. I'm the cloud architect at Nectar. Uh, midway through this presentation, I'll be joined by my colleague, Sam Morrison, who's the uh, technical team lead at the University of Melbourne for the Nectar Cloud Node. And uh, today, uh, we're going to go through a bit of context about what Nectar is, and hopefully, as the title suggests, uh, deal with some of the uh, interesting things that we've encountered during running uh, cloud for the research community over the past 13 months. So just to set the context, I think it's appropriate to highlight some of the strategic investments that the Australian government has made in the e-research sector. E-research, for those of you who aren't familiar, is basically research plus technology, and that's a good thing. This diagram is really complicated, uh, but in general you can see a whole bunch of projects, timelines in green at the top, and funding amounts uh, in the bottom. And you can see that we are talking about uh, a wide range of investments uh, over a 10-year period, starting from a, uh, I probably don't need to go through all of this today, but just to point out some of the other ones to set the context. Australia has an academic and research network that today provides 10 gigabit connectivity to universities and research institutes around the country with uh, tens of gigabits uh, internationally. And that's getting an upgrade in, for example, the $37 million uh, research network program there. Uh, so that within the country, by the end of the year, we'll be doing about 80 by 100 gigabit uh, between sites and increasing that international link uh, to capacity of about 100 gigabit. There are other projects to do with peak computing, including funding high performance computing for the life sciences. Um, climate change, of course, is a, a very important one. And uh, other projects such as radio astronomy and the square kilometer array. There's always been, uh, since 2008, some funding to do with collaboration research tools. And uh, that is where the Nectar project came from uh, in 2011. There's also a new project designed to provide data storages, uh, data storage, uh, and that's the IDSI project, which has about $50 million of funding that will probably, in addition to our cloud, provide 100 petabytes of storage for research. So what is Nectar exactly? It, it's uh, actually an acronym. It stands for the National E-Research Collaboration Tools and Resources Project. Uh, and we love our honey style theme. But uh, essentially, it's a $47 million initiative uh, out of a, a bucket of money from the Australian government called Super Science. And it's designed to enhance research collaboration uh, through the creation of e-research infrastructure. So essentially, it's divided into four different programs. You can see that we've got some infrastructure style programs. The Research Cloud is hopefully what we're here to talk about today. We've also got the National Service Program, which is a bit more like your traditional enterprise hosting environment. We use that for all of the really core services, things like uh, AAA and, and uh, those kind of things. We'll also touch on the virtual laboratories and e-research tools, uh, which are research software programs. Virtual laboratories are quite sizable uh, investments between $1 million to $2 million, uh, and they're designed to create exemplars of e-research. For example, if you've got data coming off a beamline of a synchrotron, you want to store it in some storage here, process it with HPC, move some analysis onto the cloud, and provide everything through a web portal after. That's an example of a virtual laboratory. Uh, e-research tools, smaller projects, uh, kind of hundreds of thousands of dollars, up to a million dollars, designed to fix capability gaps in specific research areas. Anyway, so that's what Nectar is at a project, as a project. Who are we in terms of OpenStack? Uh, and uh, we're quite amused to see the University of Melbourne popping up in, in graphs like this, which was the Folsom commits for all projects. And again, in uh, 12th place for, for Grizzly. So we must be doing something. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a bit of a hack. I mean, it's mostly from documentation commits. We all know that's really easy. <laughs> But uh, anyway, there's a couple of people at the summit that you might have seen on your review process before. This guy standing next to me, uh, if you want to talk about how we've used cells in production or basically uh, any part of OpenStack is a fantastic generalist. You'll find him in the author's file for almost everything. 
Um, we've also got Kieran, uh, who recently, yes, he's in there in the back, uh, who has recently got his Horizon Core um, certification or, or whatever, and uh, he's been doing a lot of work basically taking feedback from the real users that we've got and improving the usability of Horizon and extending it. Uh, if you've read that book, you probably know more than I do. Um, I'm one of the authors of that. But anyway, the Research Cloud, finally getting to it. It's basically a platform for innovation. And uh, our, my, my boss, Glenn Maloney, famously says it's a platform for failure. And that's really quite an interesting term. Um, but research is an inherently risky business. And essentially what we're trying to do with this cloud is enable researchers to have a very low barrier for access to computational resources. And that means success can happen faster, but it also means the cost of failure uh, isn't happening. And I think, you know, if we've got cancer researchers who are logging onto the cloud and just using some extra cores, doing some random stuff that they wouldn't otherwise do, just because they've got this extra resource, that's probably a good thing. Uh, essentially, it's an OpenStack cloud. It's split across eight different sites, but has a single API endpoint. Um, it's built to a research spec, and researchers, uh, unlike many of the office workers around the world, don't just work nine to five. They tend to work crazy hours, 24 hours a day, and collaborate internationally across any kind of boundary. They're, they're fantastic at working around any kind of policy. Um, so essentially, uh, we're dealing with any researcher in the country's publicly funded research institutes uh, doing any kind of research. And that's not just the hardcore sciences. We've also got lots of people from the humanities, as you'll see later on. And uh, we think the scale of the cloud, uh, by the end of the year, we, we have to spend all of our money on, on hardware. And uh, it's going to be about 30,000 cores across those eight sites run by completely different organizations, which uh, Sam will touch on a bit later. So one of the questions we ask, always get asked, just to run through it quickly, why are we doing this ourselves? Why wouldn't we just give lots of money to existing fantastic commercial cloud providers? Part of the reason is to do with the funding and the politics in Australia, obviously, but there's also a couple of other reasons that um, you know, we think are really significant, which gives us uh, benefits. And just run through this quickly. What we found is uh, a real honeypot effect. You'll see from our graph of users on the next slide, as soon as we created this cloud, bang, within the first couple of weeks, we had like 300 users. And then the word of mouth started going outward. And creating a community, just like OpenStack has a fantastic community around our cloud, is something that we're seeing. And users are helping users, which is great for reducing support costs. Local infrastructure is also more responsive to research needs. And uh, I'm not sure if you've ever tried calling up Amazon saying, hi, I've got one researcher who just wants to do this. Can you add a feature for me? And seeing how they respond. I've done that. It doesn't work that well. Um, and uh, so we can actually take feature requests and thanks to OpenStack being a very flexible platform, change the middleware. Uh, our cloud is free. That's kind of something that uh, we need to be able to have a great deal of control over the infrastructure at every level to offer a service model like that and deal with, uh, rather than a cost-based model where people pay real dollars uh, to access the cloud, have these really fuzzy things called research merit and uh, judge research uh, on this finite resource against other research to determine who gets that 1,000 core allocation. Uh, probably number four is the biggest one, though. Uh, so we've got a ton of existing infrastructure, data centers, data storage, scientific instruments around the country. And having a cloud in the same data centers as those or access to that very high performance network I mentioned before is, is critical. And then just to round it off, data sovereignty. We all know a lot about data sovereignty. We've got particular data, particularly medical data, which if that even crosses state boundaries, we, we get in trouble. So um, we went live in January 2012 and uh, put out this announcement. Since then, thanks to this graph, you can see that we've got almost 
2,000 users. That little initial spike you can see there is what I mentioned before. There was just this pent-up demand in the research space for cloud computing, despite the fact that large commercial clouds like Amazon existed. And uh, since then, we've accumulated a great deal of users uh, who are already able to publish more research based on the resources that they've got available here. So one of the best parts about being involved in a project which has a mandate for openness is putting up slides like these. You can see we've got about 7,000 cores in total right now, and uh, both of these sites at the bottom will be doing more procurements. You can see that we've got a whole range of vendors up there, and uh, this, I, I think, is a, a fairly solid statement that OpenStack works with a large range of hardware. So thank you to all the vendors who gave us good deals and uh, please continue to do so in the future. You can see also on the map there, uh, Australia, for those of you who don't know, is uh, roughly the same size in terms of land area as the United States. So to get from over here on the East Coast to the West Coast, about a five and a half hour flight. So for example, uh, Going from the QCIF to the IVEC nodes, you kind of go down the coast in terms of the fiber. So we have some interesting things with latency there. But anyway, um, on to some of the use cases. We've got a whole range. Uh, sorry that that's cut off. High throughput computing is uh, what that, that word says down the bottom. Ranging from high throughput computing just to people using a one core web server. And it's amazing what kind of impact having free access to a one core web server has for someone like an archaeologist who traditionally never really gets considered in terms of providing uh, infrastructure budget. So we've got archaeologists out there, we've got people researching wine who are doing very interesting things with spectroscopy and chromatography. Uh, possibly one of the, the few users of, uh, in the world on cloud computing who has a lot to do with rock concerts. So we have a, a project from the digital humanities who are basically taking all of these uh, cultural databases like the, the gig guide and uh, stuff like that, about 35 of them, combining them into a portal and making it so that humanities researchers can search across all of these databases, create virtual collections, annotate them, extend them, share them. And that's uh, a fantastic collaboration. We've also got uh, some of the more traditional users. Uh, you probably saw this morning in the keynote the, the particle physicists are uh, a nice big user in our cloud. We've got radio astronomy, uh, the Square Kilometer Array project. You should look them up. They've got some fantastic requirements as well. Climate science, genomicists, marine science, even people who are looking at disaster management during forest fires, of which we have quite a few in Australia. And you can see there's quite a range there. One project, just because someone dared me to put an Australian animal in this presentation, this is a crocodile, it's, it's not an alligator. Uh, this, is, this is a multidisciplinary project, which I think is really cool because you've got zoologists working with electrical engineers and essentially what they're looking at is animals moving around uh, so they can track the decline of their habitat uh, based on the urbanization of particular areas. And that's important because you kind of want to know if the crocodiles are moving into your suburb. So they have a little portal in our cloud where you can actually plot uh, all of these animals around, and I, th I think that's pretty cool. So um, we're live. What problems have our users had? And so uh, we're going to try and be really honest here. Um, I'm sorry, the speaker's notes I can't really see, so I keep referring to these slides to remember what's on there. Um, but uh, we have had hundreds and hundreds of support requests since this went live, because researchers are at all different levels of IT. You've got the people who you know, have really fantastic white beards who have probably never used a computer before, through to the, the brand new uh, software engineering graduates who are just hacking 24-7. Uh, one of the biggest usability things is it's possible uh, in OpenStack very easily, and, and this is a great default security policy, but uh, interesting in terms of usability. Really easy to start up an instance and have absolutely no access to that virtual machine. And that's probably our most common request. So we've looked at ways uh, to make that more usable. Um, 
other usability things. Some of our more advanced users had too many security groups to the point where the launch button was pushed off the edge of the page and they couldn't launch instances. Uh, we allow uh, anyone to upload any type of virtual machine to our cloud, which uh, is, is pretty gutsy according to some people, but um, that results in enormous list and currently in Horizon, it, it's difficult to distinguish the, the good golden images that we kind of prepare at Nectar versus all of the other images that people have made public. And that's something that uh, we've been putting a bit of effort into. Uh, there are a lot of different storage types in, in the cloud and uh, we've had a real user education push to try and get them to understand that object storage, you cannot mount it and ephemeral disk, you know, is ephemeral and volumes are this and that and the other. And uh, so that's one of the most red docs that we've got. Uh, we have a lot of people trying to follow our documentation, but then they try and use the client tool that's in the repository of their distro. Um, and it's too old. So we point people at the, the PyPy repository and, and things get better. Uh, the S3 APIs and the EC2 APIs do not have all of the features or have weird uh, incompatibilities, like you can't have a slash in your bucket name. So people, even if they're familiar with using those APIs, come to our cloud and, and go, hang on, what's going on here? This, this works, it's supposed to work. Uh, snapshots were very slow to create, and I know the code has been improving over the releases, but uh, we had, uh, we kind of pushed them a bit early on, and so many people started using them, and were having bad experiences that that generated a lot of tickets. Um, they also found that the storage performance wasn't good enough. We'll talk a bit more about that later. And of course, creating an image is really, really difficult, so that's one of the most involved support ticket requests that we get is helping people create images and uh, when they're not going well. So we've been live uh, for 12 months. Thankfully, we haven't had too many security incidents. Uh, we've seen a lot about open DNS servers recently with all of that fantastic DDoS. That's probably the most common one. And uh, we're very lucky to have uh, all of the university security teams as well as OzCert very vigilant on that, so we tend to find those very, very quickly. Um, we've also had a couple of spam sources. We had one user who decided it was a great idea because we just drop stuff on port 25 because we have a no mail service policy in our cloud, um, who started arguing with us about our security policy being too onerous and all of this kind of thing after we found out that you know his machine was compromised and, and spamming the world. Uh, we also had uh, another spam source, which was basically a student that got onto the cloud, started up a machine and kind of forgot about it. Um, and then we found one really interesting compromise, uh, which was basically a virtual machine that was clicking on ads, uh, just doing that 24 hours a day. And that was easy to track down because it was just thousands and thousands of HTTP requests. Uh, to the point where I think, uh, what was it, the, the Con contract, contract cool. table filled up and uh, was, was pretty interesting. Um, okay, so in terms of our side, on the infrastructure side, um, the, I've got to go more quickly now, sorry. The API scales out very nicely. OpenStack does its job. The underlying storage, uh, we've had some issues there because we hadn't had experience with this before and made a bad choice in terms of uh, what was provisioned there at the University of Melbourne node. The object storage works really, really well. It's really easy to administer. It's fantastic. The upgrades work. Use it. Uh, but we need to do more to increase uptake. We think it's fantastic, but we haven't communicated that well to our users. We've got every single staffing problem under the sun from not enough staff uh, not enough money for staff, too much money to staff, but I'm not, unable to increase the salaries. Uh, the staff that we've got don't have the skills, and so you're probably familiar with those problems. And um, Sam might talk a bit about operational tools later on. But of course, uh, we've talked about uh, today the infrastructure as a service solution that we provided. That's great but it's absolutely useless for the vast majority of our 65,000 research staff in the country who are not able to install their operating system or don't particularly want to be sysadmins. And we don't want them to be sysadmins. We want them to be doing research. 
And so we're very, very strongly uh, this year moving towards platforms and software as a service solutions. Uh, so Nectar's funded those virtual labs and research tools, which is great as a starting point, but we don't have nearly enough money to kind of get everything we want to get done. So we've been focusing on developers and getting them cloud ready and uh, uh, having developer days around the country to ensure that those software developers working with the researchers are able to uh, get stuff up and running. And uh, focusing there, rather than creating like an app store kind of within the institute or within a domain. So archaeologists generally want to talk to archaeologists. Just running through quickly because I'm stealing all of Sam's time here. Um, yep, and basically we want to do that through recipes, toolkits, and scripts. Uh, we use a lot of Puppet for the infrastructure. We found that a lot of the application people are using Chef. Things like that are really great to share around, sharing virtual machine images, and hopefully uh, we will be talking about, cloud, uh, talking about research and no longer having to talk about cloud anymore because the infrastructure is just working. And I think the sign of a good infrastructure is when you don't even notice it's there. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Sam and uh, I'll sit down. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Cheers. Um, so Tom's been uh, you know, outlining what we're, we're about. And I'm going to start just talk a little bit about you know, what those challenges were and kind of how we solved them in a technical sense. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have is that we've got you know, eight institutions, they're all separate, they've got all their own policies and networks and everything and uh, you know, we've got to try and you know, bring these together in a single cloud. Um, so technically we do this with Nova Sales, I'm not sure if you, anyone, you know, you might be familiar with Sales, it's a kind of a new concept that's coming in, um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, um, you know, there's obviously the political challenges and that's where it's about Tom, we have Tom for that. <laughs> Um, so in, in, uh, at, the, at the University of Melbourne, we run the, uh, the central services. So we, we have you know, your central keystone dashboard um, and a glance registry. And then we have at a, at a, at a site, um, we have the, the Nova, Nova cluster and Nova cell. Uh, they all run their own Swift clusters separately at the moment, um, hoping to get some region into region support there um, with Swift and uh, just some glance kind of caches really for our so the images are nice and close. Um, one of the big things that Tom has also mentioned is, is with the, um, how we're different is really, you know, researchers don't pay for us. Um, so <laughs> that's, um, that's really cool because, you know, we can just get people going onto a cloud without us even knowing and doing stuff and it's, you know, doing research and that's really what we want. Um, um, some of the things we've been uh, developing on OpenStack, on top of OpenStack, uh, you know, we, um, we try and run as close to stable as possible. Um, shibboleth login, so we have a, a federated um, SAML-based uh, you know, identity management with all in Australia called the AF. Um, so all our users have accounts on there, so it's, for us, we just put that in front of our dashboard. Users can use their you know, own, own university credentials, they log in. And they're away, and they're away, you know. Like it's, it's, it's a, it's really, it's really good. It's really easy. We don't, you know, we don't have to manage anything. You know? um, we've been playing a bit with kind of geo distributing glance, um, and I think there's actually a talk coming up soon, that I, which is going to talk about that more. But um, trying to deal with uh, how that works at the moment, we've got kind of glance APIs around, and they kind of cache images, um, but uh, and in a central glance registry because we we don't want people to have to copy, you know make two copies of images and stuff like that. So, um, and yeah, of course, sales, which I'm going to talk about, talk about soon. Um, we use Puppet. We're not really different uh, in terms of using Puppet. Now, lots of people use Puppet. Um, unfortunately, when we started uh, our cloud, um, there was no real um, good Puppet modules out there. So that's kind of why we are still rolling our own. Um, I'd, I'd love to move over to the, to the great ones developed by Puppet Labs. but. Um, one day maybe we'll, we'll have the time. Um, we have a central puppet server and um, we try and get all our nodes to use the same one and, and use environments so we kind of have a good um, common code base for all our deployments. Uh, but we try and keep it lots of flexible because there's lots of different environments out there, different hardware, different network topologies, so they kind of get a bit complicated. Um, and then we, we try and um, copy some of the stuff that OpenStack do with their, their QA process, which helps us, you know, develop. Um, yeah, so 
cells. Um, so cells are, um, for those people who don't know, they're kind of like a way to split up a single NOVA installation into kind of multiple ones. And um, you can do this for scaling. It's originally developed by Rackspace. Um, and they use it to scale out because they've got lots of compute nodes. You have lots of compute nodes talking to one rabbit and one MySQL can get, you can get problems there. So you can logically separate that out. And we kind of do this logically separating our output on our, our site level. So we're kind of, I guess it's uh, geo-distributing our Nova install. Um, and yeah, just it's a little uh, graphic of what we do on the dashboard so we can have our, our users choose which, which um, cell to launch on. This is, this is also important because they have other, you know, they might have some research data or something close to, your, to that cell, so they need to launch on a specific one, or, or else we just leave it up to the scheduler and they can launch, and it will just launch somewhere around the country. Um, So how does this work technically? We, we have, um, each cell has, uh, has a, Nova, a Nova cell, but then we can also have uh, multiple cells at a site. So the way cells work is a hierarchical thing, and we, it's kind of like a tree structure. Um, so for instance, uh, at the University of Melbourne, we have two data centers. So we have kind of a, a cell at the top, which is the kind of nectar cell, and that does all the scheduling on a countrywide level. That comes down to a Melbourne cell, and then that does, then does the scheduling within Melbourne. And then we drop down even further to each data center. So, we, we, so it really allows uh, each site to have their own policies in terms of scheduling. They can, they can choose how they, they, they schedule their nodes, and, and they can also have different hardware. So you know, if we've got different flavors, like GPU flavors, you know, we can, you know, some sites might prefer that. And, um, so it gives, a, it, gives, it gives a lot of control back to uh, the sites, I guess, for us. And that's, that's something that we want, is, is really important for us. Um, so we um, we grabbed our, the the code for uh, cells from Chris uh, in, in, the, in the not the early development, but they were Rackspace were running live uh, with the code, but it wasn't yet in uh, in um, OpenStack. Um, so we've we've taken our version of Stable Folsom, which is pretty much um, you know vanilla Stable Folsom, and we've we've got Chris's code chucked it on top of that. Um, and then we've uh, worked uh, on improving it. Um, now that sales is uh, in Grizzly, um, we're going to start, you know, pushing these things back. We'd love that we're going to hopefully have some time to get some blueprints up. Some of the things, uh, if you were at the uh, talk yesterday from Chris, he, we mentioned a few things that were not implemented, and we've kind of done some of those things. Uh, security groups is a big thing. We, um, you know, we want we don't want users to have to create security groups in each cell, you know, and things like that. So we've got, you know, security groups in common. Um, you know, um, being able to select and a lot of the things between cells and scheduling and filtering and, and that kind of stuff, we've, we've done a bit of work on there. Um, you know, when we have a new site coming online, we don't want them to all of a sudden get flooded with, uh, with instance requests because they're, they're, you know, got the most capacity, so we kind of try and ease them on to our production site. Um, yeah, and it, our goal is really to, to get all this back and, we, you know, we don't want to be managing all this ourselves, so hopefully we can do that in the Havana cycle. Um, uh, it's a quick little slide on uh, high availability. You know, as I mentioned, we have our, all our central sites are all in one place, so we really need to have those highly available. And most of the pain point isn't actually with OpenStack itself; it's with the things like MySQL and uh, Rabbit and you know th things like that. I mean, uh, OpenStack itself is is quite nice in terms of its architecture for scaling for most of the stuff. Um, Um, so, we do all our packaging in-house. Um, it's a bit slow, um, you know, the, the way OpenStack is moving, it's quite a rapid, you know, m code base that's moving and we have to kind of, you know, adapt to that pretty fast and, and waiting for a, a patch from going from trunk, you know, down to the stable branch and then, you know, going into a Ubuntu package, we, we're all on Ubuntu here. It, it can take some time and, and you know, if, even if it gets that far. So, we do a lot of t a lot of time spent on um, you know finding those patches, you know backporting them, you know getting them into our own package and um, and um, you know rolling them up ourselves and also with all our sales code we need to kind of make our own packages. Um, and we've got a few mods to Horizon and, and Keystone to do some stuff with the shibboleth and uh, etc. Um,
Uh, we've, we've tried to emulate a lot of what um, OpenStack has done in the, in the QA space. Um, we have our own Garrett and Jenkins. Um, and this helps us push things to production faster. And I, I, I really like what OpenStack do in terms of their, their quality assurance and their, just their rolling out of code. So we try and emulate that as much as we can. Um, you know, I, I, I love just pushing out things to production you know, as, quick, as, as quick as we can. Um, and, and this helps us a lot. Upgrades. Upgrades uh, are the, probably the hardest thing you can do with an OpenStack uh, cloud, I think. Um, we started in Diablo. We actually start, we added Pilot Cloud in, in uh, Cactus, um, but we started in production in Diablo and we've, we've been live and up since then. Um, Diablo to Essex was a lot, of, a lot of a pain. I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but it was a, a big pain trying to keep you know, everything running while upgrading. Um, Going from SX to Folsom was a little less. It was, you know, it's getting better. And uh, I'm hoping when we st we're starting to look at Grizzly now, it's going to be even less. And, you know, um, one of the main, um, main things we really plan for when we're doing these kind of things is keeping the instances running. Um, some people might, you know, in a commercial sense, I guess it's the APIs, you know, that's the, that's the main thing. But for us, it's really those instances because, you know, that's the, that's the researchers, scientists, you know, they, 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 you know, they need that. Um, so, yeah. Um, a lot of database hacking, you know, a lot of dry runs. We have a good test environment, you know, so it takes a lot of time to just do some planning on how to upgrade um, OpenStack, but it's a lot of fun, actually. It's one of the funnest times <laughs> that I uh, enjoy. Um, Grizzly. Um, some of the things we're looking forward to in Grizzly is, is some of the more operational tools. Uh, one of the things I think is lacking in OpenStack is really um, Things to make it easy to operate. Um, things just like querying for you know users or who's got this role. You know, just just simple things like that uh, are, are hard. And, and hopefully that you know Grizzly can um, make that easier. Um, there's also a nice patch we've got in with uh, with uh, images in the dashboard where we can we can have images listed in a certain category. So we can say, look, you know, these are you know gold star nectar approved images, and you know you can you can show them there, or we can say, look, these are ones that you've created, and, and you know these ones are the the wild west. You know, use at your own risk, um, and, that, and that's going to hopefully help our support teams because we have a lot of lot of support requests about images. Um, couple, I'm pretty disappointed that multi-host is not in quantum. Um, I really want we use Nova Network still, and, and we uh, you know to move to quantum we need to we need feature parity with with Nova Network, um, and still battling with Keystone DB migration, still not working. If you're upgrading. It uh, doesn't work yet, still. Yeah. Uh, one thing we're looking at the future of Salimeter, I think if, um, this is something that's going to be really cool. We, we really have no idea about some of the stuff that's going on in our cloud and, and trying to plan for uh, expansion or you know, upgrades and, and, and when we're trying to, you know, we've got a lot of storage issues at the moment, you know. Actually, trying to nail those down to what you know, how much data are we pushing out of our cloud, and, and, and this kind of stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping Solometer is is going to going to just help us there <laughs> and do it for us. Um, and it's also we need we need this for uh, you know we need, when we're uh, coming running out of money soon. Uh, you know we need pretty graphs and uh, things to show the the government to say you know we are useful. People are using us, and this is how much you know this is how much we're using it. Um, Um, future, um, we've, we've actually got only two sites in production currently, um, Melbourne University and Monash University. Um, we're going to be putting on uh, one of the Queensland states in uh, two weeks' time and then five more to come. So it's, it's an exciting time trying to you know, grow that sales and um, you know, we, we brought the first one in uh, two weeks ago and you know, there was a few teething issues, but um, I think you know, in terms of what the sales is doing, it's really good and it's it's, it's working how we need it to work. Um, we're also at the moment we don't actually provide any volumes, so volumes is something that we're going to be looking into uh, in the next kind of round. Um, you know, we I th we have a lot, lots of um, people that need this for EC2 compatibility. You know, they're using EC2 and, and their specific code uses volumes, and you know, they, you know, they want to use our cloud. Hopefully that's going to help them. And yeah, um, I think that's all I've got actually. Yeah, I thought I had one more slide. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs>
I think we're almost running out of time anyway. Um, so question time. In the service catalog? In Keystone. Ah, uh, okay, no. No, so in, in, in Keystone, uh, it's just one endpoint. Okay, so there's one, there's one, um, yeah, only one endpoint, really. Does that make sense? So there's, an, there's only one over API, and how users can view other, how they can figure out where the other cells are. We've, we've kind of mapped cells onto availability zones for us, so in EC2, if you do list availability zones, you'll get a list of cells, um, and uh, and opens that, you know, on the dashboard, you know, you can, you can see the list there. Is that that's your question? Yeah, are uh, you? So uh, the, the resource allocation oh. process uh, that we've got right now is an interim process, um, effectively because we're trying to also hook into these other national um, processes. But effectively, because we're bringing up uh, capacity so quickly these days, we tend to be very liberal. And um, at the moment, through the Horizon dashboard, we've actually added a panel there where once you logged in, you can request an allocation, tell us about the use case, how many cores you need, all of this uh, kind of stuff. And that goes to a committee who assesses it based on its merit, the appropriateness in terms of uh, the amount of allocation that they've got, and then eventually it becomes a, a quota on the cloud. Uh, okay, yeah, so we have, uh, we, we have uh, the API, I mean, it's, it's really just, we just scale it out, um, you know what I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to scale out the Nova API service, so um, we have, we have nine, nine API servers, I think it is, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it seems, it's working well for now, um, Keystone, um, with the central Keystone, like, because you've got all the things talking to Keystone as well, that's something that I think we're going to have to start looking at a bit more. It's, we're getting to a bit of a, bit of a peak there. Um, but I think there's a lot happening there in terms of the PKI for Keystone, so things that need to keep talking to Keystone, they can validate the token on, on their own thing, and, and also with Memcache on all the hosts, that, that also keeps that down. So there's, there's lots of techniques you can do there for you know, limiting your API requests. Uh, yep. <laughs> yep, so that's the RDSI project. Unfortunately, for the most part, you'll have to go and talk to them. Um, they've been having a lot of closed door meetings that we're not invited to, despite the fact we're supposed to be working together. Um, but in general, it'll be uh, split up into a few different uh, categories of funding, and they'll uh, be some common protocols between the different sites like us, they're actually, RDSI was designed to be at all of our sites, so we should have some silo of hard disks uh, at every site. Uh, one of the things that we think is going to happen is that some of that money from RDSI will be used to prop up our volume service, and uh, we think that's a, a nice way to provide some persistent storage uh, to researchers. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, at the University of Melbourne, we have a NFS, NFS at uh, Melbourne. Um, local storage and they're using block live migration. Um, I'm not exactly sure how they're doing it, to be honest. <laughs> but it uh, seems, uh, if you've got NFS, it works fine. Um, but then, you know, there's other problems with NFS. Indeed. Yeah. So, because we've got all these different sites which can have different configurations, we've yeah. also got people looking at Ceph and Gloucester and all yeah. of these other things as well. Whatever works. Yeah. So the object storage service hasn't been so popular and part of that's our fault because we haven't really marketed it very well. Um, we've been so focused on the, the virtual machine offering. Uh, so what we're doing now is actually looking for services to put on top of object storage and make it sexy and, and get people in there. Um, so there's a range of uh, things there, and we saw the uh, Savannah announcement recently, which is Hadoop backing onto Swift, and that's for an example of one of the things that we were looking at 
but suggestions are welcome. If you've got applications that work in object storage, we'd love to uh, have chat. Zero VM, excellent. <laughs> So at the moment, we run with no contention. It's a one-to-one -one mapping between virtual core and physical core. Um, and that's working for us right now because we've got capacity. Down the track, yes, we might look at corralling the little one-core web servers into their own little bit and oversubscribing. But uh, in general, for the science workloads, we're always going to be one-to-one. -one. They just chew the CPU. No more questions. Looks like it. Oh, nope. one more. You just mentioned CPU work. Um, how, how is your experience? Haven't got there yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Still looking for info. <laughs> Any? One more. It's KVM. Yeah. KVM, Ubuntu 12.04. There's no more questions. In theory, I think we can go to lunch. Thank <laughs> you.